You are now tuning in to Youth, Youth Voices, Voices Amplified, a podcast production from the Community Enrichment Project, a youth civic engagement nonprofit. Welcome back to the Youth Voices Amplified podcast, and I'm your host, Zoe. Today, we'll be diving into the recent Mikva Challenge First National Youth Summit held in D.C. The event took place over three days, and we want to highlight it because it's one of the largest events of the year where youth are able to come together to practice advocacy skills as they promote solutions for a range of issues important to them. A hundred youth in grades 7 through 12 from all over the nation discussed, learned about, and advocated for their concerns related to things like education, mental health, the environment, and community safety. On top of that, they met with local leaders and decision makers on Capitol Hill to raise their concerns and talk about effective policy ideas. Democracy is a verb. As unconventional as that sounds, that's the core belief of Mikva Challenge. At Mikva Challenge, we envision a world that values Mikva Challenge is a civic education organization with a mission to develop empowered, informed, and active youth. Here's Robin Lingo, Executive Director of Mikva Challenge DC, describing the history of the organization at the 2016 Breaking Through Power Conference sponsored by the Center for Study of Responsive Law. The late Judge Abner Mikva, um, who just recently passed away. Uh, we uh, were founded by a group of people who had worked with Judge Mikva, um, either who he was a representative from Chicago for a number of years on the Hill, uh, circuit court judge, and then general counsel to President Clinton. And when he retired, a group of people decided they wanted to do something to honor his legacy of having worked in all three branches of government, and that it didn't um, make sense to wait until people passed away to honor their legacy, and they wanted to do something while he was still living. And so they had a dinner, and apparently their first suggestion was a named Hill internship for college students. And Judge Mikva and his wife, Zoe, who was an educator, said, that is really boring. We have no interest in doing that. Everybody does that. And they got into a conversation about at what point in their lives they had felt like this democracy belonged to them, like they had a role in the way our society worked, and that they had become engaged and interested in politics. And everybody went around the table and talked about a formative experience in middle or high school. Most of the people around that table came from middle class backgrounds, um, white people, mi middle class men, and they all had these formative experiences where they had felt like they were a part of our system. And so Judge Mikva said, well, we need to do that in Chicago, in Chicago public schools. So they started the program 17 years ago. And originally, the program was just helping high school teachers get young people out um, volunteering on campaigns. And they did that for a number of years, just helping teachers facilitate young people to go out door knocking and phone banking of candidates of their choice. Um, from that, the young people and the teachers said, you know what, that's great. This is really helpful. We have great discussions when we come back into the classroom on Monday about what we're doing. But we need a little bit more context to be able to think about how change happens. And so from there, we developed what is now our largest program, which is called Democracy in Action. Um, and it's a curriculum um, called Issues to Action, where we take young people and students um, through a process of thinking about their community's strengths and weaknesses, what are the issues they see in their community, and how to make change. It's a six-step process. It's basically a community organizing curriculum that takes young people through identifying an issue, doing a root cause analysis, again, looking at that iceberg situation and thinking about what is below, picking one of those root causes to focus on, uh, thinking about how do you influence a decision maker. So one of the classic um, examples we always use in talking about the curriculum is if um, you pick the issue that there is not uh, soap in the bathroom, which to many of the adults in this room may sound like a small issue, but if you've ever been in a high school, in a public high school, it's not. There is often not soap in the bathroom. And you think about then what, uh, what so if your issue, what, what does the principal care about? The principal cares about school attendance. The principal cares about 
test scores and kids showing up at school. So having soap in the bathroom means that kids don't get sick, that kids come to school, and that's how you influence the person who has the decision. So it helps them think about, instead of just uh, going out and creating posters, what does the decision maker care about and how do you influence them? How do you get to make the change you want to be see? And how do you think about what is the right action? Is that if you want the food in the cafeteria to be better, is that a protest march or is that a meeting with the principal? Is that a letter campaign? What is the right way to attack that issue? And then going out and actually doing it. The organization has come a long way from its humble beginnings. In 2023, they hosted their inaugural National Youth Summit. First up for the summit was Soapbox Nation, Mikva Challenge's public speaking program. The objective of day one of the summit was to build a sense of community and teach networking skills. Here's Robin Lingo again on how Soapbox program operates. The first part of the curriculum is thinking about what is the biggest issue facing your community. And we have an activity called Project Soapbox where every young person gets up and gives a two to three minute speech, delivers um, a call to action on that issue, and we invite guests and um, adults to come in and listen to the students and then have a citywide competition where kids come together from across the city to hear those different issues. Held at the historic Ford's Theater, the National Soapbox event captured the call to action speeches of a dozen pro Project Soapbox students who were chosen from among tens of thousands of their peers. Let's dive into a few of them. Here's Ian delivering their soapbox speech on the discrimination of members of the LGBTQIA plus community by individuals and politicians and the impact on their community. One day this past fall when I was walking down the hallway, I stopped to avoid running into another student who had cut across my path. As a result, the students walking behind me were forced to stop as well and one of them decided to call me something. Do you want to know what they called me? Faggot. I wish I could say the ideas behind that language are few and far between, but they're not. These bigoted and hateful opinions exist nationwide and stem from the same lack of education, awareness, and understanding, all while hurting and even killing real people. There is a taboo around being gay, anything gay, even just the word. Saying it even makes me a little uncomfortable. The taboo around it is extremely similar to those surrounding serious crimes such as rape and even murder. These aren't topics to be discussed with children. They're for private adult conversations that end when a child enters the room. This treatment of the topic teaches kids that these are horrific crimes and hateful feelings develop towards the perpetrators. However, when the LGBT community is treated in the same way, with hushed voices as if it's inappropriate, homophobia and transphobia develop in children, and those resentful feelings only grow with age. My own cousin, who was only 10 at the time, once told me that I was bad and evil. As a surprise to no one, these feelings have made their way into our government. For example, Representative Mike Johnson of Louisiana introduced the Stop the Sexualization of Children Act in 2022, which in reality was a national don't say gay bill. It would have banned books and the teaching of curriculums containing sexually oriented material, which was defined as any depiction, description, or simulation of sexual activity any lewd or lascivious depiction or description of human genitals, or any topic involving gender identity, gender dysphoria, transgenderism, sexual orientation, or related subjects for children under 10. Laws like this have been implemented across the country, some even extending K through 12. These censorship laws strengthen the taboo surrounding the LGBT community ultimately causing more homophobia and transphobia to develop within our country. And this is a serious problem. It's hurting people, even killing them. The American Psychiatric Association says that LGBTQ people are more than twice as likely to develop a mental health disorder, 
specifically 2.5 times more likely to experience anxiety, depression, and substance misuse. According to the CDC and the Trevor Project, suicide is the second leading cause of death for young people aged 10 through 24, with LGBTQ young people four times more likely to attempt it. The CDC even directly states that LGBTQ people are placed at higher risk because of how they are mistreated and stigmatized in society. Another student named Adrian spoke more about the LGBTQIA community and the need for effective sex ed. I don't really agree with that lifestyle. Oh, and don't start spreading things around. The LGBTQIA community has faced ignorant comments like that for decades upon decades. Harmful biases against queer lives muddle sincere discussions about sexual safety. Comprehensive sex education secures the person's ability to express their sexuality and equips them with the actions they must take to prevent unwanted outcomes. But if we allow dehumanizing assumptions to lead conversations on sex education, it only ends disastrously and as seen in our country's history, deadly. Let me take you to America in the vibrant, vivacious 80s. HIV ravaged the nation, infecting mostly gay and bisexual men. Seen as a divinely ordained consequence of gay liberation, fervent conservatives attached HIV to queer identities, a stigmatizing stain on homosexuality. President Ronald Reagan actively promoted this homophobic idea it was his duty, his responsibility to protect his citizens, but he chose to defame AIDS victims, offering no federal help in promoting sexual awareness. And what came as a result? The death of 100,000 American citizens between 1981 to 1990. The queer community was ridiculed, disregarded, and deceived. But through the advocacy of countless LGBTQ-led movements, the stigma surrounding HIV has subsided, allowing for more meaningful sex education. But is it truly effective? According to the Human Rights Campaign, 30% of gay and bisexual men do not feel comfortable disclosing their sexual behaviors to healthcare providers. We need comprehensive sex education that distinguishes sexuality from STD prevention to ensure a safe clinical environment. The California Healthy Youth Act, passed in 2016, promised its students the inclusion of affirmative discussions about all sexual identities, as well as the denouncement of damaging social views surrounding HIV AIDS. Last year, I completed a digital edition of Making Proud Choices, one of California's approved sex ed curriculums. It made important clarifications about HIV, but it did not treat queer relationships with the respect the Healthy Youth Act promised. Queer identities were barely mentioned, and it was always brought up in the context of HIV AIDS prevention. Understanding how AIDS impacted the queer community as a result of the Reagan administration's lack of care for unprejudiced sex education is vital in approaching LGBTQ issues in the modern day, because HIV is not their identity. Education like this reinforces harmful stereotypes that discourage real protection for queer lives. And as we've seen on a national scale, discrimination toward the queer community has only run more rampant. We can no longer neglect the value of comprehensive, inclusive sex ed. We deserve a world where the youth feel safe, confident, and affirmed in their identities. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from another student who discusses a different societal stigma, not related to gender and sexuality, but connected to race and ethnicity. Jermaine's speech was on the lack of guidance and structure amongst young boys. Revenge, retaliation, respect. This is all the young boy knows. Shots, shots, shots. This is all he hears as now those bullets become music to his ears. A lack of guidance and structure only leads to crime within our community as a man of the opposing race may walk down the street and his look past as if he hit the dust in the wind. But a man that looks like the boy is a target and maybe a threat. The boy only knows money, murder, and madness. The boy's enemy number one is not only the stigma society puts on him, but also the other boy, who is nothing but a carbon copy of him, a 
just minor differences in the story. Studies from the U.S. Department of Justice shows black homicide rates are seven to eight times higher than those of whites. And also, according to FBI data, of the 2,491 murders of black people reported in the U.S. in 2013, 2,245 of those perpetrators were black. And 189 of those perpetrators were white. The boy thinks he's alone in this cruel world. As unbeknownst to him, he has been public enemy number one since the day he was born. Terrorizer, thug, threat. This is how he is seen to the general eye. In our communities, there should be a chance for our young black boys and girls to hear about career choices and mentorship, knowing that there is someone out there that cares about them. There should be programs set in place in our recreation centers to shed light upon trees. With teaching our young kids how to conduct themselves in a positive manner, giving them the tools to succeed in the world where they are counted out. Opportunity, optimism, obedience. This is what the boy needs. Shots, shots, shots. The boy no longer thinks of bullets when he hears shots, but now he thinks of a chance in the world. They ended their speech by switching the script, saying that with the right support, young people of color will have higher chances of succeeding in life. But what if the lives of our youth are in danger in other ways? Let's listen to a bit of Isabella's speech on school shootings in the U.S. and the need for gun control laws. If I don't make it, I love you and appreciate everything you've done for me, said Sarah Crosby Kelly. Can you imagine receiving that text from your child, sibling, spouse, or even best friend? Unfortunately for Stacey Crescitelli, that nightmare became real. Practicing on stage, everyone was preparing for the upcoming musical. Singing, dancing, laughing, until bang, gunshots started to go off. Not just one, but enough to take the lives of 17 people and injuring 14 others. Yes, Sarah survived after hiding in the bathroom for two hours, but can you imagine how that exact moment changed the rest of her life? The Stoneman shooting was just one of the 107 mass shootings that occurred in 2018. Maybe that number doesn't sound big to you. In 2022, at least 3,179 people were shot, both killed and injured in the U.S. Do you think strengthening gun control would make a difference? Because I sure think so. What's wrong with trying to enforce something that will bring no harm to society and potentially peace? As a junior in high school, I don't want to be scared to go to school, knowing a school shooting occurred just about 28 miles from where I live. On November 30, 2021, Tate Meyer, Hannah St. Juliana, Madison Baldwin, and Justin Shilek all had their lives snatched from them. Guns gave us freedom is one of the most absurd things someone can say. Freedom is the idea that people are free to do whatever they want under the circumstance that no one is being harmed. 107 school shootings in 2018, 112 in 2019, 113 in 2020, 240 in 2021, and 257 in 2022. Does this not consider hurting anybody? Freedom? Where's the freedom of families whose lives have changed forever? If gun controls aren't put in place, this number will only go up. Even if you don't have direct experience with school shootings, have some sympathy for families' lives who have changed forever because of your decision to oppose gun control. You never know how much you regret something until it affects you. In order to combat this problem, we need to end the Dickey's Amendment. Since 2001, the CDC has not been able to fund any research studies about gun control, despite knowing it is one of the top five reasons for deaths in the U.S. Why? It is because of the Dickey's Amendment that was put in place to supposedly stop the anti-gun bureaucrats at NAIH and CDC from producing biased anti-Second Amendment research about gun control. To me, that just sounds like a bunch of excuses to protect the Second Amendment, not us Americans. So please, if you have some sympathy for families who's, who have to mourn for their loved ones for the rest of their lives, go out and demand your representatives and senators to overturn the Dickey's Amendment. The day after students delivered their speeches, they met with Congress people on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., also known as the Hill. The overall objective of day two of the summit was to elevate youth voices as they proposed their suggested policies, ideas, opinions, and perspectives on the national political stage. They met with Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, who is D.C.'s delegate to the United States House of Representatives and pro tip since D.C. is in a state, and that's a whole nother story, that's why Representative Norton is considered a delegate to the House instead of a full representative. But I digress. 
They also met with the U.S. Representative of Michigan, Jack Bergman. So if you're someone, as a student, do you feel as though you're not in a secure environment in your school? Yes. So that someone, okay, all right. And then that fear can turn it, turns into anxiety and can turn it into depression and so many other mental health illnesses. Representative of Illinois, Lauren Underwood. So listen, I know that there's a group here from Illinois. And another representative of Illinois, Chewy Garcia. Violent civic engagement, direct action by laying down in front of a busy intersection in Chicago. To discuss things such as elected leaders, personal experiences as activists and politicians, and various youth raised topics related to environment, education, mental health, and gun violence. Last on the student's agenda was a visit to Gallaudet University where they participated and heard Mikva alumni and local DC leaders and then had opportunities to network with the panelists. And the final day of the summit was focused on connecting decision makers with teens to help them inform and enlighten adults. It's clear that the National Youth Issue Summit was a time for students to explore their leadership skills, create memories with their peers across a ton of issue areas, and to take with them, them a strong sense of agency and a pathway to pursue their advocacy dreams. An 11th grade summit participant summed things up best when she said, The Mikva Youth Summit 2023 in D.C. was one of the best experiences I have ever had. I'm so happy and grateful to be a part of this event as it has allowed me to step out of my comfort zone. I grew stronger bonds with people I have known and created bonds with amazing people that I was able to meet during this summit. From never have I ever to lobbying, Starbucks to karaoke and to amazing roommates, the Mikva challenge has brought me many core memories that I will cherish. With this being my first visit to D.C., it was a once-in-a-lifetime experience that I'm so happy I signed up for, talking to staffers for representatives, senators, and even other students about issues we want to see brought out of our community has been something I never knew I would do, yet it showed me the importance of the youth's voices. Thank you, at Mikva Challenge, for this amazing opportunity. To all the youth trying to make a difference, keep up the great work. You are who the world is waiting for.